SIGT Report is proudly brought to you by Tower, rural insurance specialists. Welcome to Tower Sector Report. I'm David Beetson, and this week we're digging around the very foundations of agriculture, fertilizer. And it looks like farmers are plowing profits back into their paddocks this spring. But spring seems to be sort out time in the pip fruit sector. We check out why. Well, over the last week, Fonterra has delivered good news to dairy farmers about its payout forecast for the 2012 dairy season. And Beef and Lamb New Zealand is predicting another high earning year ahead for sheep and beef farmers. But is there confidence shared out on the farms where it really counts? Well, the answer lies in, or rather on the soil, at this time of the year. One of the best gauges of farmer confidence is fertiliser application. So our Rural Affairs correspondent, Drew Chappell, has been checking out the barometer. Spring is well and truly here. The season of growth and new life, be it lambs, calves or grass. The weeks between September and December are traditionally some of the busiest in the farming calendar. With so much growth and usually some helpful spring showers, it's the ideal time for most farmers to give their pasture a little helping hand in the way of fertiliser. The early spring period is where the uh, value from increased grass is at its greatest. So if you have to provide animals with feed from imported feed, it's at its most expensive. So using fertiliser to boost feed that's generated on the farm is the most profitable time as now. And probably the only way to do that in a short term period, like in a matter of weeks, is to use nitrogen. So tactically that's why farmers use nitrogen this time of year. You know, the inputs are more like 10 to 12 cents in terms of the cost of nitrogen, but the economic returns are 30 cents or more. So they're basically doubly tripling their, their return on investment. The country's largest fertiliser company, Balance Agrinutrients, has been in the New Zealand farming scene for more than 10 years now, though its roots can be traced back to the middle of the 20th century. Head of Research and Environment for Balance, Warwick Kato, says over time, and with a lot of trial and error, most farmers are getting the nutrient mix and timing about right. Having said that though, there is still a lot to bear in mind. Nitrogen's a relatively safe fertiliser to use, um, but there are metabolic risks with other forms of fertiliser and this relates primarily to phosphate fertilisers and potassium fertilisers. So if I deal with the phosphate fertilisers first, they naturally have a natural contaminant fluoride and particularly if you're top dressing with phosphate fertilisers at the moment there's a risk of stock poisoning. So the key message there is phosphate fertilisers should have a spelling period of about 10 days that reduces any risk of ingestion of that fertiliser and a poisoning risk. In terms of potassium, it's mainly tied up with the metabolic issues uh, and particularly around this period of lambing and calving it's important to keep it away from that period so putting potassium inputs more into late October. In the Ministry of Agriculture's latest available data from 2007 nearly 4 million tonnes of fertiliser was spread over 220,000 hectares of farmland. That's fertiliser like urea, potassium, superphosphate and lime all in an effort to help our pasture grow faster and turn it into profit, be that milk, wool or meat. Warwick Kato says those figures are sure to be higher in a year such as this, where good returns mean higher investment in pasture. Well, I've been in the industry for about two decades or more now, and this would be the most buoyant period that I've seen. And you know, dairy's been very strong for the last three to four years in particular, but what is making this big difference is the sheep beef industry in particular. And what we've seen last year is very strong demand for fertiliser from that sector, and we're expecting that to increase, particularly once people get some certainty about returns. Returns are forecast to be very good, but at the end of the day, farmers, I think, are waiting to see the money in the bank. And once that happens, we're expecting a very strong autumn demand from the dry stock sector. Fertiliser usually makes up more than 20% of annual farm expenditure, so it's a weighty decision to invest more in your nutrient levels. Nick Riley is a balanced sales rep, 
working with hundreds of farmers in the Pukekohe region. Reps like Nick are farmers' first point of contact with the fertiliser industry, and he says it's been a huge relief to see good returns across most farm types this year. We've certainly seen a um, seen a reduction in the amount of fertiliser applied uh, in my area over the last um, last three or four years, and um, yeah, it's also great to see the um, the sheep and beef guys having a bit of a um, a respite now. Um, you know, we've seen uh, we've seen lamb value as well in excess of a hundred dollars, and um, you know, the, for the bull guys and the and the uh, the beef guys, the schedules been up over four dollars. So that has seen um, you know that's uh, certainly resulted and a few planes flying around out in the country in the autumn which um, yeah we haven't heard the echo of uh, echo of planes in the valleys out there for a little while um, you know it's great to see uh, great to see those guys being able to afford to put some fertilizer on now Warwick says the relatively mild winter across most of the country has helped but as always you can never afford to be complacent I think the main risk period is people really waiting to see what the forecast for the summer is and this last summer um, we had what a very dry period up to Christmas but then it got very wet post Christmas and that, that caused significant supply problems for us because no one forecast that but some years so that's the biggest uncertainty for farmers is it going to be dry or a wet summer because that's probably the critical period they need to prepare for. With the price of fertiliser trending steeply upwards over the last few years Many farmers have understandably cut back on their investment in pasture growth aids. Both Warwick and Nick, however, say that is a mistake. Fertiliser prices are, are much higher, you know, they're probably two to three times higher than what they were probably four or five years ago, but equally product prices have improved uh, as well. And so the economics is, is, uh, means that although demand will increase, it probably will be used more judiciously than what it might have been in the past. And that's a good thing. It means that people are using uh, fertiliser environmentally, responsibly, getting the best economic outcome and trying to minimise any environmental footprint. For now, agriculture continues its inexorable growth, fuelled by foreign demand for good food, in much the same way that urea or superphosphate fuels the grass that makes it all possible. We think the outlook for agriculture is very strong and as I say to my non-agricultural colleagues it's a very good time to be in agriculture. I think the outlook for that in the next 10-20 years is very strong and I think we've seen a step change in terms of the future and so for us it's very exciting, it means it drives innovation and I think it's all good. Drew Chapel reporting. Well, if there's good news for farmers, it's good news for the fertiliser companies. But does it work the other way round? We'll find out next on Tower Sector Report. Welcome back to Tower Sector Report. Well, New Zealand's leading fertiliser companies have reported healthy profit increases this year and that's meant healthy rebates and returns for farmer shareholders. But as demand rises, fertiliser prices are rising too. So to find out what's driving those prices, we're being joined by Larry Billado, Chief Executive of Balance Agri-Nutrients. Larry, welcome. Thank you. Okay, you're the barometer of the, of the health of the farming industry. Uh, fair weather ahead? Yes, indeed. I don't think you could pick a better industry to be involved in than agriculture. The fundamentals are strong. I'm sure we'll see our ups and downs over the next little while, but generally the direction is positive and it'll be a good year and it'll be a good year for farming. Plenty of fertilizer going down. There is a lot of fertilizer like going down. Any, any indication as to how much more it's, than say last year or the year before? It's early to call. We usually work on a financial yeah. year that starts at the beginning of June. So we're only three months into it. Weather has a lot to do with the uh, performance in the first three months. So that's about a typical start it, to the year. It's but been a soft start. It has been a soft <laughs> start. Absolutely correct. The, all, of, all of the indications we're getting from farmers, though, is that their fertilizer purchases will be strong. They will be buying what they need to buy. You've got the dairy sector doing well, despite high dollar. They're holding their uh, forecast payout. And you've got sheep and beef just looking marvelous right mm. now. So we're, we're quite optimistic about the, uh, the spring season. Well, let's turn to the other <coughs> side of the equation. Uh, your capacity to hold prices. <coughs> 
you held them through last autumn. Uh, what's the price trend going to be from here on? We will be uh, increasing our prices this week on two or three products, not key ingredients. Uh, Superphosphate is the biggest uh, demand fertilizer in New Zealand by a huge margin. We'll hold the price on that, but some products like urea, DAP, we will be increasing the price. Not a, not a lot, three to five percent, but uh, international prices are driving that. What we're finding is the increase in those prices is so great, it's offsetting the stronger dollar. So is that dollar driven or international competition for supply? Inter or constraint on supply? International competition <coughs> for supply. Like New Zealand, agriculture around the world is doing very, very well. Um, and with that, demand is going up for fertilizers, so prices are going up with that. It's a supply-demand mm. equation. At the other end of that pipeline, however, it means increased competition in the export markets. Yes, it does. Yes. Okay, because if they're doing if they're doing exactly the same thing as we're doing, like increasing fertilizer application, it means they expect that they'll increase production. Yeah. For the most part, though, the 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 world production of and use of fertilizers will be in grains and corns and things like that, where New Zealand really doesn't uh, compete the same way. So New Zealand is almost sheltered from that increased production and output of, uh, of some of these products. Okay, uh, but in terms of the areas where we actually do need the imported ingredients of fertilizer, the nitrogen, the phosphate, the potash, what's happening in terms of those supply lines? The, uh, we're seeing prices on all of those products go up, but we've used this term volatility. Everybody understands it. The, it's just such a volatile market right now. Uh, on a week-to-week -week basis, we'll see urea prices go up, come down, and it's just fluctuating all the time. Uh, it can be a production outage. It can be a, uh, a tender that goes out in India for 500,000 tons of urea, and all of a sudden prices go up, the tender gets closed, prices come back down. So this, this volatility makes predicting trends in the short term difficult. Longer term, though, we see prices continue. Does that mean that you can actually, as a, as a relatively small international player, be quite opportunistic about when you go in and out of the market? You try to do that. <laughs> yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> but uh, if we could pick our highs and lows in the market perfectly, all of us would be uh, doing different things. Let's turn to your manufacturing capacity because I know that you were running at around 95% of your capacity last year. Have you got any plans to increase that capacity? The, uh, we, we manufacture both urea and superphosphate in New Zealand. In urea, that capacity is at maximum. Uh, we run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, right through the year. We are looking at plans to increase that, uh, that facility. Uh, right now, there isn't anything in the short term, but uh, we will be trying to do something in the next couple of years. Uh, the um, resource consents, you've got, you've got resource, resource consents renewals going, you've got Wangarei air discharge, Awarua air discharge, you've got eight consents required at Kapuni, presumably for uh, your, your gas. Yep conversions. Mm -hmm. uh, how's that process going? You having any difficulty getting the resource no. consent? The Wang Array <coughs> resource consent has been granted for both air and water. One of them's 25 years, the other's 35. We're in uh, great shape there. Mm -hmm. uh, our Arua isn't until 2014 and we're starting the process, but we've got a fair bit of time to, uh, to go through that. And Kapuni, we're in the middle of the process. I don't anticipate any difficulties with that. Uh, it, just in the middle of the process. In terms of your distribution, which is the, the, the next leg of the double, uh, it was expanded last year. Is that development going to continue again this year? Will you be doing more distribution development? We, we pretty well have all of the holes in our distribution network filled now. Uh, a couple years ago, we, we bought the uh, majority shareholding in Summit Quinfoss. They had a network throughout the country. Uh, the last couple of years, we've been, uh, I guess, rationalizing that. We've shut down some stores. We've picked the best out of uh, all of the facilities. That There's a bit of work to do in that, but really we're it's in pretty good shape. Up. Yes, it's a tidy up, exactly. Oh, okay. Uh, in, just shifting to another area, the, the steps you're taking to support farmers growing production and in achieving a, a lower environmental footprint at the same time. How's that process going? It's and, 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 and what's the will of farmers to actually take this environmental message aboard? 
dealing with the environmental side to that question first, we find that most farmers understand the need to improve their environmental footprint. The easiest way to sell it, though, is to demonstrate to a farmer that if they're using less energy, if they're using less inputs, fertilizer is a great example, they're saving money, they're reducing their cost, so there's a financial benefit to it. And if you can show a financial benefit to a farmer, he's going to take it up. So now it's tell an easy me, are one. you cutting your own throat when you do that? Well, because when you when you start say look, reduce your fertilizer bill, that doesn't sound like a fertilizer <laughs> manufacturer to me. You're right, it doesn't. But because we're a cooperative, it just makes such great sense. Our customers are our shareholders. So we can go to our shareholders and say, use less money, you go to our, and, and we're talking to customers at the same time, use less fertilizer, I should say, and it makes sense for them. So we're doing right by our customers and our shareholders. The cooperative, cooperative structure is just such a vital piece to that puzzle. It works perfectly. Larry, ETS, uh, the Emissions Trading Scheme, is that impacting on your costs, say through your fuel bill, your gas bill, your electricity bill, your, your, con your heavy consumers, how is this actually affecting you? It, uh, it certainly does have an impact. All of our fuels, electricity have gone up as a result of the ETS. It isn't significant at this point in time, but if carbon prices continue to go up, uh, it will become more significant. Our facility at Kapuni is a large user of gas. The uh, cost of the uh, gas will have an ETS component on it. Right now we're shielded from a large portion of that, but over time that will continue to go up and it will be significant in the future. A quick final comment on one debate, animal nutrients versus plant nutrients. Now I know you've been doing some diversification, Mm -hmm. Where do you think the future lies? We, uh, we use the term total nutrient management and it actually just works, again, it's a perfect uh, concept. Uh, for a farmer, the first and best priority is to grow as much grass as he possibly can and Balance can do that with the use of fertilizer, but you run up to a limit of how much grass you can grow and if you want to increase your production, get more out of the shoulders of the season or just better animal health, that's where animal nutri nutrients have a great role to play and it fits in perfectly. So we can help a farmer get the absolute maximum out of his farm. Larry Bilodeau, thank you very much. Thank you. Larry Bilodeau, Chief Executive of Balance Agronutrients. Coming up, what's going on in the pip fruit sector's sorting sheds? Stay with Tower Sector Report. Welcome back to Tower Sector Report. New Zealand's pip fruit industry has been having a rocky ride. The country normally earns about half a billion dollars a year from export sales of apples and pears, but it's a tough trade and it's not getting any easier. New Zealand pip fruit growers are being crunched by static demand and increased competition from other supplier nations in our traditional UK, Europe and USA markets. In Asia, our pip fruit trade is being conducted in US dollars and the weakness of that currency has been shrinking returns to kiwi orchards. And there's been a hitch or two in the effort to introduce New Zealand apples to our closest and most difficult market, Australia. So there was plenty of scope for robust debate when the growers met at their conference in Havelock North, as I found out when I spoke to Pip Fruit New Zealand's Chief Executive Peter Bevan last week. Peter, at your recent conference you had a veteran grower, John McCliskey, warning that bankers and international customers were starting to question your industry's viability. Is that, is that a view that you share and was it a wake-up call? Uh, look, I think that those sorts of questions have been asked for 10 years now, which is the length of time since deregulation. Um, and the fortunes of the industry have certainly fluctuated during that time. And largely, um, it's, a, it's a consequence of where the exchange rate happens to sit. For instance, when um, I first started exporting apples uh, just after deregulation, um, our exchange rate against the UK pound was, was uh, 28 pence, and now it's over 50. So that makes a hell of a difference to the price you need mm. to achieve in the market. So, um, you know, the industry's viable. It's actually um, the, probably the most efficient uh, apple producing country in the world, and we certainly uh, have a future for the past two or three years where we've really adjusted our sites from the traditional markets in places like Europe and the UK and the US 
uh, and there's a much greater focus on Asia, which of course is much closer to us, uh, and it's where we can achieve premium prices. Okay, can you just give me a picture of the current state of the of the major export markets: um, UK, Europe, United States, and in Asia and China. When I became CEO seven years ago, something like 75% of all of our production was exported to the EU. Now that percentage is less than 50. Um, and Asia's gone from being 12, 13% to uh, nearly 40% now. So there's been significant change, and that's meant that we've needed to change what we produce as well because those, those tart apples like um, Braeburn, for instance, don't have a home in Asia. So we need to concentrate much more on um, apples that are you know, bright colours, red, and uh, a sweeter, like Fuji and raw gala and so forth. In Asia, uh, it's a fixed price market, so you negotiate the price before the fruit leaves. And therefore, an exporter negotiates a price, he can talk to his supplier, um, they can agree on what the price will be, and if the grower's happy with the price, then the fruit will go. Whereas in Europe, it's a consignment market, so, you know, the fruit's sent 35 days on the water, and it's sent to an importer who then negotiates the price, you know, two months down the track. So there's much, much less certainty in our traditional markets, which is another reason why the Asian market's attractive for us. I've seen no evidence at all that there's going to be a change away from trading in US dollars. It's just the way the business has always been done. Um, but the Asian markets hold um, uh, a real future for us because there's growth rates up around 10% annually, um, and there's um, a, an increasing uh, middle class uh, who, who want to buy imported apples because they see them as as safer and they see it as a status symbol um, and also there's a huge growth in western style uh, retail formats in those countries. Well the new trade, the, the Australian market seems to have gone off to a bit of a bad start with uh, one of the early shipments being rejected by the Australian biosecurity authorities. Are things settling down now that we're, we're into it? Well, in actual fact, it's proof that the system works. We have um, Australian uh, inspectors out here and they do pre-clearance inspections. They look at 600 fruit from each lot that's put up. Um, and, and the fact that uh, you know, they've found an actionable pest indicates, in fact, that the system works. So uh, the Australian but to, but to be quite clear on this, yeah. that pest had never left our border. Yes, that, that's the point. Um, the Australian industry has no risk from this because the rejection has happened here in New Zealand and the fruit's been sent to other markets. Well, you've got the South Australian government actually talking about imposing quarantine zones around their apple growing districts now. Uh, what, what's your attitude on that? Yeah, the, the New Zealand industry is just quite bemused by the response across the Tasman and, and it's almost as if the, they've become to believe their own myth about the risks that fire blight might present to their industry. And, and the reality is, if you think about the pathway for fire blight to get into Australia, it's just, it's nonsense. It's almost impossible that it could happen on a mature fruit. In fact, at the WTO case that I attended, one of the expert witnesses, uh, who was a scientist who was an expert in fire blight, actually said that there's more risk of uh, fire blight bacteria getting into Australia, blown across the Tasman on the wind, than there is of it arriving on an apple. So that tells you that the risk is, in fact, incredibly low. So have you been talking to growers about tightening up at this end and, and really making sure that things are clean because of the very close scrutiny that the Australians are putting on the fruit? I suspect that um, the New Zealand industry has perhaps underestimated uh, to some extent just how difficult the protocols are going to make access. Um, there's audits of pack houses, there's um, minute inspections of all the fruit. Um, the, the production systems are quite demanding for supply to Australia. Um, and it's not going to be easy. So we're going to have to be pretty careful as an industry um, just in how we select the fruit that goes up for uh, pre-clearance inspections and so forth. And, and uh, look, I'm confident we'll get there because this is, a, this is a very smart industry, but it's not going to be easy. And the Australian industry probably can take some comfort from that. Well, you've been pressing the development of an overarching New Zealand brand for the industry. Uh, given the robust debate that's been going on, can you see any progress being made? There's probably a, a greater realisation now than ever before that what we are selling is little pieces of New Zealand and I think most of our exporters recognise um, that New Zealand is the brand that enables us to achieve premium prices uh, and, and I think that there's a, a need for us to have a, an overarching brand but it's got to be complementary to the exporters own brands and that's the challenge for us as an industry to, 
to find ways to make that happen. But we uh, we had a, an interesting um, launch of a of a hundred percent pure apples from New Zealand brand, which was done by Sir Richard Hadley in India mm. this year. It went down very well. It attracted a huge amount of attention, and I think it's probably um, set a pathway for us as an industry to follow. You're on the road. We're on the road. Yeah. Peter Bevan, thank you very much. You're welcome. The Chief Executive of Pip Fruit New Zealand, Peter Bevan. And that's all for now. Remember, you can catch our show again anytime via the internet at www.country99tv.co.nz. Thanks for your company. I'm David Beetson for Tower Sector Report. Bye for now. Report was proudly brought to you by Tower, Rural Insurance Specialists.